Welcome to chapter 10 of Wilson Rawls' book, Summer of the Monkeys. I woke up the next morning with a pounding headache and twice as sick as I had been the day before. My whole body screamed for water and my throat was so dry I had to jiggle my Adam's apple three or four times just so I could swallow. I had such a nasty taste in my mouth it reminded me of the time I had eaten green persimmons. When I first opened my eyes, I couldn't remember a thing. For a few seconds, I didn't even know where I was. Everything I looked at was going round and round and round, spinning like a top. Then, little by little, the spinning slowed down and stopped until things started coming back to me. The monkeys, the whiskey still, drinking the sour mash, and the loss of my britches. The more I thought about everything that had happened to me, the more ashamed I had become. I tried covering my face with a pillow, <coughs> but that didn't blot out a thing. I was lying there feeling sorry for myself and wondering how Rowdy was making out when Papa and Daisy came in to check on me. Papa smiled and said, how you feeling? I'm sick, Papa. I said, I'm sick enough to just die. Papa laughed and said, oh, I don't think you're going to die. You may think you will, but you won't. In a day or two, you'll be good as new. Papa, I said, I don't know. I didn't know that that sour mash would get you drunk. I thought it had to be made into whiskey first. Shaking his head, Papa said, oh, no, sour mash will make you as drunk as, a, as the whiskey does, but twice as sick. Once that stuff gets down in your stomach, it just keeps on fermenting and you'll be sick for days. <clears throat> Until then, Daisy hadn't opened her mouth. She just stood there looking disgusted and listening to Papa. Turning to leave the room, she said, well, I, best bet, I guess I better get busy because it looks like I'll have my work cut out for me. I was so sick, I didn't pay much attention to what Daisy had said but I should have known what I was in for. Another one of their Red Cross nursing go-rounds, and that's all there was to it. I didn't have to worry about Mama paying me a visit because she was really put out with me. This didn't bother me too much because Mama's mad spells never lasted long. My Mama was just about like any other boy's Mama. She would stay mad at me for a little while and then she'd start feeling sorry for me and everything would be all right. Papa said, I can't understand why you drank that sour mash. I know you found the stills before, but I'm pretty sure you didn't drink any of the mash. I didn't, Papa, I said. That was the first time I ever drank anything like that. Everything happened so fast. The first thing I knew, Rowdy and I were both drinking it like water. Papa sat down on my bed and said, Suppose you start at the beginning and tell me all about it. I'd like to know just what did go on down in those bottoms. I could always talk to Papa much better than I could to Mom. It seemed that he understood me a little better. I figured that it was because he too had once been a boy like me. I told Papa everything that had happened. But I was so ashamed about losing my britches, I didn't even look him in the eye while, tell, while telling it. Papa laughed and said, To me it looks like that Jimbo monkey wanted to get you and Rowdy drunk so he could steal your britches. What do you suppose he did with them? I don't know, Papa, I said. He could be wearing them for all I know. I wouldn't put anything past that monkey. Papa said, Well... I can't see where there's been too much harm been done, but I don't believe I'd tie into that sour mash anymore if I were you. It might get to be a habit, and that's not good for you. Papa, I said, you do not have to worry about me. I won't be drinking any more sour mash or any kind of whiskey as long as I live. <clears throat> if drinking makes a fellow sick as I am, I won't ever drink again, and I mean it. Papa smiled and said, you know, if a fella can learn something through an experience when he's young, he doesn't ever forget it. I won't ever forget this, Papa, and if I ever get a hold of that Jimbo monkey, he won't forget it either. Papa laughed and said, 
I've always figured that a man can do almost anything he puts his mind to if he doesn't give up. I won't ever give up, I said. I'll chase that monkey if I have to chase him clear to Arkansas. Getting up from the bed, Papa looked at his watch and said, Your mother and I are going to the store today. Is there anything you want me to tell your grandpa? Just tell him I'll be up to see him in a day or two and that we'll have to figure out some other way to catch those monkeys. Papa smiled and said, I don't suppose you want me to tell him about how you lost your britches, do you? Oh, I don't care, Papa, I said. Mama will tell Grandma all about it, and then she'll tell Grandpa. As long as we keep it in the family, I don't mind so much. But I sure wouldn't want anybody else to know. Chuckling to himself, Papa left the room. It wasn't long until I heard our old wagon leave and screech its way up the road. I had just about dozed off when, to my surprise, Daisy came into the room. She was all decked out in that silly-looking red cross uniform and she was carrying a tray with a large bottle of castor oil and an empty water glass sitting on it. I could see that she had a book tucked up under her arm. I thought, oh no, if she gives me a dose of castor oil and then starts reading to me, I surely will die. It was the same old thing that I had gone through a hundred times before. Smiling all over, Daisy said, good morning. And how is my patient this fine morning? Oh, for heaven's sakes, Daisy, I said, please, I am too sick to go through any Red Cross nursing business this time. I don't believe I can stand it. <clears throat> I thought you went to the store with Mama and Papa. You always do. How come you didn't go this time? Oh, I wanted to go, Daisy said. I wanted to go very much, but Jay Berry, a good nurse, never leaves her sick patients. You didn't have to stay here just because of me, I said. I'm not that sick. I will never be that sick. For all the attention Daisy paid to my protest, I may as well have been talking to a post oak stump. Taking out her thermometer, she started shaking it. And just I just groaned and crawled way down under the covers. Daisy started pulling down the quilts and saying, Jay Berry, you're acting like a little baby. Now you sit up here and let me examine you go away I shouted I'll be all right if you just go away and leave me alone for a few seconds there was complete silence then I heard Daisy say well it says in my nursing book that when a patient gets truly unruly a nurse is supposed to be stern reaching down under the covers Daisy grabbed a handful of my hair and she I was squealing like a scared chicken as she pulled out my head and pulled me toward the head of the bed and propped me up into a sitting position by the hair of my head. Now, Daisy said, sticking the thermometer in my mouth, if you'll just be patient, this will be over in a few minutes. I was too sick to fight anymore. All right, I mumbled. If I die, it's going to be your fault. Daisy smiled and said, Jay Berry, you're not going to die. You may think you will, but you won't. In a day or two, you'll be good as new, I hope. You're just saying that because I heard Papa say it, I said. No, I'm not, Daisy said. I'm saying it because I'm a nurse, and nurses are supposed to cheer up their patients. I knew all too well that once Daisy had gotten into one of her Red Cross nursing spells, <clears throat> it was ridiculous to even think of trying to argue with her. So I just groaned, closed my eyes, and sat there while she looked me over. Counting silently, Daisy took my pulse. Then she looked at my eyeballs, felt my brow, tapped me around with her fingers. She even laid her ear on my chest and listened to my heartbeat. And from the expression on her face, I seemed to be in pretty good shape until she took the thermometer out of my mouth and looked at it. Frowning and letting out a low whistle, Daisy said, Boy, Jay Berry, you have a fever. Why, it almost busted this thermometer. Now this scared me a little. I knew that I was sick, but I didn't think I was sick enough to actually bust the thermometer. Daisy said, let me see your tongue. By this time, I was getting a little bit on the nervous side. Without any protest, I stuck out my tongue as far as I could. Daisy looked at it, making a sour face. Yuck, Jay Berry. Your tongue is coated. It looks like the inside of Papa's shaving mug. This really shook me up. 
Is it bad? I said. Oh, it's not too bad, Daisy said, but it's bad enough. I think I know what's causing it, too. You do? What's causing it? Daisy said, Remember what Papa said about your stomach being full of old sour mash? As long as it's in there, you'll just stay sick and your tongue will be coated. Daisy, I said, I'm sick all over, but it's not my tongue that's sick. What are you going to do now? I don't know, Daisy said. She reached over and picked up the book she had brought with her when she came in the room. I saw that it was her nursing book. Daisy wet her thumb on her tongue and started thumbing through the pages. Jay Berry, she said, I don't know a thing about doctoring a drunk. I've looked through all my nursing books and I can't, can't find anything that tells me how. But I know that somewhere in there, I've read somewhere, it does tell how to keep a patient's tongue from being coated. Daisy, I said, I don't think that I'm drunk. Do you? Just because I got drunk once doesn't mean I'm drunk now, does it? I'm not too sure about that, Daisy said, still turning pages and not looking at me. From what I've heard and read, that's the way drunkards get started. They have one drink and then they have another and another and another, and pretty soon they're drinking it by the barrel. Daisy, I said very seriously, if I live through this, you won't have to worry about me ever drinking another drop of mash or whiskey. I can promise you that, while I'll even cross my heart and hope to die. With a very sad look on her face, Daisy said, I hope not, Jay Berry. I sure would hate for us to grow up and have people see you staggering around in the street and saying, that's the old drunkard, Jay Berry Lee. He's Daisy's little brother. I don't believe I could stand it. I just wouldn't put up with it. I tell people I didn't even know you. Oh, Daisy, I cried. I'm not, I'm so sick now. I'm not an inch from the grave. And you keep talking about all these bad things in the future. <coughs> I thought you said that nurses were supposed to cheer up their patients, not bury them. Just then, Daisy's face lit up and she said, ah, there it is. She sat down on the foot of my bed and started reading in silence. Finally, after what seemed like a week to me, Daisy sighed, closed her book, and said, Jay Berry, I think what you need is a big dose of castor oil. I always did think <clears throat> that the very thought of castor oil was enough to make a buzzard sick. Castor oil? I said. Why, Daisy, I couldn't even think of anything to eat. I couldn't even think of that nasty stuff. All you think about is castor oil. If I even mash my finger, the first thing you grab is the old bottle of castor oil. Oh, Jay Berry, Daisy said, taking the stopper from the bottle. Castor oil isn't hard to take. If you just close your eyes and swallow, you can't even taste it. I can't, I, I can taste the darn stuff, I said. <clears throat> I can taste it even before I can take it. Holding the bottle about a foot above the glass, Daisy started pouring. The very sight of that slick, slimy looking stuff gurgling down in the glass was more than my poor old stick stomach could bear. I jumped out of bed, flew to the window, and threw up all over the place. As I was crawling back in the bed, Daisy giggled and said, Jay Berry, I'm a much better nurse than you think I am. I knew that I'd have trouble getting you to take the castor oil, so I did the next best thing. I just let you see some of it. I figured if you saw some of it, that would be enough to get rid of whatever is in that, your stomach. <clears throat> Worked, didn't it? I bet you're feeling better already. Ugh, I guess I am, I said. But if you really want to do something for me, go and bring me about a gallon of cool water. Daisy giggled and said, Oh, Jay Berry, you couldn't drink a gallon of water, could you? You just think I couldn't, I said. I believe that I could drink ten gallons. Well, Daisy said, if you think that you can drink that much water, I guess there's no use in bringing you a glass. I'll just bring you the water bucket. That's what she did. She stood there watching a while while I drank three big dippers of water. Boy, Daisy said, if you and Rowdy keep drinking water like that, we'll be lucky if we have any left in the well. How's Rowdy getting along, I said. Daisy frowned and said, 
I don't know how he's getting along. He won't let me close to him. Surprised at this, I said, he won't let you close to him. What's the matter with him? I don't know, Daisy said. He went out into the barn lot and dug a deep hole down in that damp, cool dirt under the watering trough. About every 10 minutes, he crawls out of his hole, rears up in the trough, and drinks water. Every time I go out there to see him, he growls and shows his teeth. I can't even get close to him. Did you have on that nurse's uniform when you went out there? I said. Jay Berry, a nurse always wears her uniform when she is on duty doing her work. You should know that much. I laughed and laughed, even though it hurt my head. <clears throat> Daisy, I said, Rowdy is no fool. He knows that that uniform means as much as I do. He's sick and he doesn't want you messing with him. Oh, I don't care, Daisy said. I'm going out there one more time, and if he growls at me, I'm going to take a bucket and fill that hole full of water with him in it. You'd better not, I said. He's liable to chase you up a tree. Sure enough, it wasn't long until I heard a big racket <clears throat> out in the barn lot. Rowdy was barking and whimpering, and Daisy was yelling and scolding. Pretty soon, everything quieted down, and I knew that old Rowdy had been overpowered and was getting the Red Cross nurse's treatment. I felt sorry for my old dog, but there wasn't anything I could do about it. I just pulled the covers over my head and went to sleep. Papa was right when he said a day or two I'd be good as new. On the morning of the second day, I crawled out of bed feeling almost like my old self again. Oh, I was still a little nervous and a bit wobbly on my feet, but otherwise I felt okay. As I walked to the kitchen table, the family had just started sitting down to breakfast. Papa and Daisy started whooping and clapping their hands like they had not seen me in ten years. <clears throat> I knew they were kidding me, so I grinned, sat down, and helped myself to a double portion of everything on the table. Eyeing my loaded plate, Papa said, When a fella starts eating like that, he's sure not sick. Oh, I feel pretty good now, Papa, I said. Right away, Mama started laying down the law to me about my drinking. She told me that if I ever did anything like that again, I could just pack my clothes and leave, and I could take that drunken old hound dog with me when I left. Daisy giggled and said, Mama, if Jay Berry does leave home, he won't have to do much packing. Those monkeys already stole everything he owns. Why, they even got away with his britches. I wanted to argue with Mama and Daisy, <clears throat> but I realized that I did not have a leg to stand on. So I just sat there, mad all over, hating monkeys, and more determined than ever to catch every single last one of them if it took me until Gabriel blew his horn. Mama said, I guess I'll have to stop my work and make you another pair of pants. Papa laughed and said, It looks like I'm going to have to be minus another pair of overalls. Overalls in my family got a really good wearing out. Mama wore mine from the backs <clears throat> of the ones that Papa wore. And Papa wore out the front, and then I wore out the back again. Jay Berry, Daisy said, Oh, Rowdy's in pretty good shape now. I finally got him to drink some warm milk and gave him a good cold bath and a watering trough. As soon as I had eaten breakfast, I went out to the barn lot, and sure enough, there was Rowdy laying on the ground and looking if as if he didn't have a friend left in the world. I walked over and patted my old dog's head and said, I know how you feel, boy. In fact, I don't see how you made it with Daisy messing with you. Rowdy was so sad he couldn't even wag his tail. Come on, boy, I coaxed. I'm going to the store and have another talk with Grandpa about those monkeys, and he might give you a meat rind. That's all it took, and Rowdy was right behind me. On the way to the store, I stopped to watch a sight that all but left me breathless. To my right, far up on the hillside, there was a loud gobbling and beating of heavy wings. Then, out of the green blanket of grass and onto the sky rose a flock of wild turkeys. I blinked my eyes at the burst of fiery bronze as they winged their way through the bright rays of the morning sun. Rowdy and I watched until they faded from sight in the thick timber of the river bottoms. Boy, Rowdy. Wasn't that something to see? You just wait till I get that 22. I'll have an old gobbler on our kitchen table for breakfast, dinner, and supper every day until I'm old and gray-headed. 
a little further along, just as Rowdy and I rounded the bend in the road, I stopped and stared at the wonderment of the sight directly ahead. Here and there alongside the long, long sloping hillside, milky white splotches stood out like buckets of spilled milk in the deep, deep green. The Ozarks, beautiful flowers, the dogwoods, were full in full bloom. Mixed in with the green and white, the deep glare of the ro red buds gleamed in the rail railroad flares in the dewy morning. As I stood there drinking in all the beauty, I said, Rowdy, Daisy said the old man of the mountains takes care of everything in these hills, and if he is, he must be working long overtime painting this picture. I had been so busy looking at all the Ozark beauty that I'd forgotten about the monkeys. When I did just think about them, I said, Holy smokes, Rowdy, we better stop gawking around and get on to the store. Grandpa will think we're never coming. To make off, to make up for lost time, I started off in a trot. Grandpa wasn't in the store when Rowdy and I arrived, but I knew that he was around somewhere because the door was wide open. <clears throat> I heard a loud banging coming from the barn. Then I walked over and found him putting a new spoke on one of his buckboard wheels. As Rowdy and I walked up, Grandpa smiled and said, Hi! Hi, Grandpa, I said. With a sly look on his old friendly face, Grandpa looked all around and then leaning over close to me, he whispered, I've got a jug hid here in the corn crib. You want a little drink? I knew that Grandpa was kidding me, so I grinned and said, Oh, Grandpa, you know I'm not a drinking man. Grandpa said, Well, I didn't think you were, but your papa tells me that you and Rowdy got on a pretty good hooter last night. Yes, we did, Grandpa, I said. But it wasn't our fault. That Jimbo monkey got us drunk. It seems like every time we get close to those monkeys, they make fools out of us. Why, they even stole my britches this time, and I'll never live that down. Grandpa just exploded in laughter. He laughed and he laughed and he laughed. He laughed so hard that big, great tears boiled out of his eyes and ran down all over his face. He even, I even laughed a little myself, but I wasn't laughing at losing my britches. I was laughing at my grandpa. Rowdy thought that because grandpa and I were laughing and were so happy, he got happy too. He wiggled and twisted all over. Grandpa finally got over his laughing fit and reached for his old red handkerchief. He took off his glasses, wiping them, and then blew his nose. Now that we got that out of the way, he said, I think it's time we start thinking about catching those monkeys. We can't let them get away with stealing a fellow's pants. Grandpa said, I've done about everything I can think about with those monkeys, and my thinker is just about wore out. I don't know what else to do. I've tried everything from A to Z, and I haven't caught one yet. <clears throat> oh, I don't think we've tried everything, Grandpa said. There's a lot of space between A and Z, and now here's what we're going to do. <clears throat> you go on home and be ready at daybreak in the morning. I'll come by with my buckboard and we'll make a trip into town. I was really surprised to hear that we were going into town because I didn't go into town very often, but just once every now and then. And What are we going into town for, Grandpa? I asked. We're going to find out how to catch those monkeys, Grandpa said. Grandpa asked, and always interested, do you know someone in town who knows how to catch monkeys? Eh, sort of. No, Grandpa really didn't really know somebody, but he said, I don't believe I know any mon monkey catchers in town, but I do know there's a place where we can find out something. What kind of place, Grandpa asked? The library, Grandpa said. <clears throat> I thought a second and said, oh, I know now. That's the place you were telling me about where they have all those books, thousands and thousands of books. That's the place, Grandpa said. I don't care what kind of problem a man has, he can always find the answer at the library. Somewhere in one of those books, we'll find the answer to our monkey catching problems. Boy, Grandpa, I said, we should have thought about this a long time ago. It sure would have saved a lot of wear and tear on me and Rowdy and saved my pants. Grandpa looked at me, and then he looked at Rowdy. 
smiling, he said, nah, I can't see any wear and tear anywhere. You both look like you're in pretty good shape to me. Rowdy had seen Grandpa looking at him, and he figured that was a good time as any to let his wants be known. His old tail started thumping the ground, and then he opened his mouth and let out a ball that scared the chickens out of the barn. Grandpa said, what was that all about, boy? Rowdy whined, turned, and bound for the store. On reaching the porch, he stopped, looked back, and bawled again. Frowning and looking surprised, Grandpa said, What's gotten into him? I couldn't help but chuckling a little, for I knew exactly what Grandpa, what Rowdy was trying to tell Grandpa. Oh, Grandpa, I said, don't pay any attention to, the, to him. He just wants a meat rind. Watching Rowdy bouncing up and down on the porch, Grandpa said, He seems to know where the meat rinds are, all right. Maybe we'd better get him one before he is, uh, has a nervous breakdown. Rowdy wound up with a big fat meat rind, and I got my usual sack of candy. I thanked Grandpa and told him that we, he would have to wait for me. He wouldn't have to wait in the morning, that I would be ready and waiting at daybreak. This has been Chapter 10 of Wilson Rawls, Summer of the Monkeys.